However, the international community seems to be going in circles, chasing ISIL out of one city only to have it then take another. Will more trainers make a difference, or is the U.S. in danger of being dragged back into another Iraq war? We're joined here in our studio by Stephen Miles, Advocacy Director for Win Without War. And in New York, we have Jonathan Gilliam, a former U.S. Navy SEAL. I want to welcome both of you to the broadcast. And we've asked uh, Sean Calebs to stay with us uh, as well for this conversation. He was in the region a year ago. I remember vividly you were there with the Peshmerga. It, was, it looked like there was so much optimism. You must be wondering, even now, how do we get from point A to point B? And you must have some questions. Well, Steve, I have a lot of questions for you, but I'd like to start with Jonathan, if, if that's okay. Uh, because one thing, after talking to military leaders and analysts, one thing that has to be disappointing to hear from the ground up is the president come out how many years into this and say the administration has no clear strategy. What does that do to fighting forces? What does it do to the U.S.? Well, it's a tremendous... It's a tremendous, it's not a shock to me, but it's, it's really a, a shame to have the president come out and say that, but it's validated everything that everybody's felt. I mean, look, I wasn't just a Navy SEAL, I was an FBI agent as well, and um, we really don't have a strategy here at home to effectively stop this insurgency that's uh, starting to grow here inside the United States. And uh, this is all the same uh, lack of strategy. There, there is no global strategy, war strategy, to defeat fundamental Islamic Mohammedism. And that's what this is. You know, it, just stop differentiating between the different groups, stop differentiating between the different countries uh, where they're fighting, and start looking at it. It's one ideology, they're spreading globally. And unless the world figures this out, um, you're going to be in a fight regardless if you're in the Middle East or in your own country. Stephen? I mean, the short answer is you don't defeat ideologies on the battlefield. Uh, you know, I'd like to think that the last 14 years of trying to fight, fight this war in Iraq, Afghanistan, elsewhere around the world would have taught us that lesson. But unfortunately, here we are. We didn't, we didn't fight the war, though. We, we've been fighting battles. You do defeat an ideology on the battlefield. They're the, they're the ones who declared war on us. Well, we so right, declare one right now, you have a situation in Iraq and Syria where allegedly we were killing somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,000 militants a month. They're recruiting more than that. Now, some would maybe make the argument that you just try to up the killing, but we've gone down that road. We've tried to just kill our way out of this problem. You're not going to kill your way out of this problem. Well, you know, it's interesting. In, in Sean's report, we heard uh, John Boehner say that there's no strategy. We heard uh, Michael Hanlon say the stakes are too high, you can't lose. And, but we also heard the defense secretary saying that they have no will to fight. So as much as you train, um, what difference does it make if they're willing to drop their weapons and run, which we've seen in the past, and sure. I'll start with you, Stephen. Sure, so I mean, we had this conversation today about 450, so we're about, up to about 3,500 uh, trainers, and military, U.S. military personnel in Iraq. There was also a report earlier this week that one of the bases where we're doing the training in Iraq hasn't seen an Iraqi recruit in quite some time. They literally have no one there. The Iraqis are sending them no one to fight. If the Iraqis can't fight this war, we can't fight this war for them. Jonathan? Well, Stephen would actually be surprised to know that I actually agree. I've listened to some of the things he says, and I actually agree with you. But the, the opposite end of where we disagree is that I do believe that going into uh, the Middle East full-fledged, where we take a full uh, a coalition led by the United States in there to the battlefield, it will be effective. However, it's not going to stop the problem, and this is where we agree. It's not going to stop the problem unless we also take it to the battlefield of the global recruitment into the mosques where it really domestically in all the countries beside the Middle East, the mosques themselves are where the biggest changes can come because that's where these people go in and secrete themselves to recruit other fighters. So it's not just the battlefield in Iraq, and that's where I think I differ from a lot of other military people, you know, we don't, just taking a fight over there or putting instructors over there, it's not going to do anything to eventually stop this ideology. We have to be able to fight them on the battlefield and fight them on the internet and then go to the mosques and, and just tell them, you have to get on board or else, uh, you know, we're going to make it happen. Well, Jonathan, Steve, I want to get your opinion on this. Let's take a look at Anbar province. Mm -hmm. It is a quagmire. Sunni held. It's where a lot of Saddam Hussein's former troops went. And uh, once uh, Maliki, the, the prime minister uh, before al-Abadi was uh, in charge, he basically did everything he could to dismantle the Iraqi army. So he put a lot of 
angry people in there who don't like the U.S. to begin with. They are siding with ISIL. They are the ones that turned over the U.S.-led weapons, U.S. weapons to ISIL some time ago. How do you broach this sectarian divide in that area? You're having now Iranian-backed Shia militia go in who are strong fighters, Kurdish strong fighters, but they're going into an area that there could be reprisals against sure. Sunnis in the area. So it's very complex. And to make it sound like it's just Iraq that is at risk is ridiculous. As yeah. O'Hanlon said, it's every nook and cranny in the globe that right now is feeling sure. the heavy hand of ISIL. So I think you have to start where you just ended. This is not just an Iraq problem. It's not just a Syria problem. There is a regional conflict going on. And part of that conflict is a regional power play between Saudi Arabia and Iran, but also between various different warring factions. You know, there's over 1,500 different armed fighting groups in Syria alone. There's dozens and dozens of different groups in Iraq. This isn't simply a battle between ISIS on one side and us on the other. There's lots of fighting factions. And the question, one of the fundamental questions we have to ask is how are you driving a wedge between ISIS and the general Sunni population. I got to believe they don't want to live under ISIS's rule. It can't be something that anybody wants. But they clearly also have major problems with the governments in Damascus and Baghdad. And until those grievances are addressed, you're not going to find any political solution to this. Jonathan, uh, Sean pointed out the complexities of this. What are your thoughts? Well, I, you know, I agree. I mean, the really big complexity about fighting over there, anywhere over there, is the fact that um, even the best fighters in the Middle East are only really good at fighting in their region or their village. Once you get them out of that, uh, historically, they're just not good fighters. Their will to fight decreases. Um, and, you know, Western fighters are just different. Here's the biggest problem I have with all this is that, um, you know, whether you're talking about the Iranians or you're talking about ISIS, look, the Iranians took uh, Americans hostage in 1979 and declared war on the United States. Um, ISIS has declared war on the United States back as far as I believe it was 2006 or 2008. I don't know the exact year. But the fact is, these are all fundamental Muslims. They just believe a little bit different of an ideology where it traces back to their heritage. But if you look at what happened 100 years ago in, with the Armenians, 1.5 million Armenians were killed. And that was only because they didn't have the ability to recruit globally or move globally. They didn't have the technology then. They do now. So. I really think we have to start looking at this as a fundamental movement that is spreading globally and the globe needs to get on board because this is not the days of Hitler when te these technologies didn't exist. The technology to move and recruit exists now and this is going to go globally. And I'll say one other thing. This is really the great, um, uh, I don't know the word for it, but it brings all the countries that hate each other together whether it be China, Russia, the United States, all these different countries have different um, concepts of how a country could be. They all have Islamic terrorism inside their borders. And that's just a fascinating thing when you think about it, because the one thing that brings us all together is terror. We're out of time, but Stephen, uh, briefly, if, one yeah, final thought. I just, I just want to take one exception to that. I mean, there, there are just tens of millions of Muslims in these countries that we're talking about who want no far part of this fight. They want peace. What we need to be doing is figuring out how to work with them, how to bring them peace and stability to their country. In the long run, that's going to be the only thing that gets America peace and America stability out of this situation. Too. Stephen, they Jonathan, need to figure out how to work with us. Stephen and Jonathan, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. And Sean, thanks for your contribution as well.